Um, so uh, talk about spotted lanternfly, which I think um, some of you have heard at least a little bit about. Um, it's kind of hard to avoid, um, particularly in my role um, as an extension associate who focuses solely on spotted lanternfly. Um, but certainly, again, it's been talked about in the media um, quite often. So I'm going to be talking about sort of the response that the public and, and people have had um, here in the mid-Atlantic in the eastern US um, and sort of where we've seen the largest impact of of spotted lanternfly. So in case you don't know, um, spotted lanternfly is the new invasive pest that we have um, in the mid-Atlantic region. It's originally native to Asia. Uh, now we believe our population in particular came from northern China and we first found it in southeast Pennsylvania in 2014. Now, based on the egg masses and sort of the size of the population that was present at that time, uh, what we found, uh, it, excuse me, it was likely established in say 2011 or 2012 and just nobody noticed it for a few years. Um, and then uh, flash forward to today, it's now spread to nine different states and it's been detected in an additional six states. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and show you that map. All right, there quick we go. question. Did you mean to turn off your video? Yes, I did. I forgot okay. to mention that. Um, I just, because of bandwidth, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off while I'm speaking and sharing slides, but I'll, I'll turn it back on for, for Q&A. Um, and, and I should also mention, sorry about that, that feel free to uh, ask questions in the chat box as I'm speaking um, and, and happy to answer those. Um, it's always great to have more participation and more people um, talking to you so you're not talking to a black box. <laughs> So, um, so definitely feel free to ask questions. Um, so anyway, as we fast forward to kind of where we are today, starting um, in 2014, we were in Berks County, Pennsylvania, sort of sort of the central part of southeastern Pennsylvania. And then it's since spread to 26 counties in Pennsylvania, but then all of these other blue areas are areas where we have an established population of spotted lanternfly. Um, so we're in nine states now, most recently added New York, Connecticut, and Ohio. Um, and we also have detections in Massachusetts, North Carolina, and then not shown on this map are also detections in Maine, Michigan, Oregon, and California. So um, this, this pest is a good hitchhiker. It has a high likelihood of spread just because it does have that human association. It's very active in flight. It lays egg masses on many different things. And in fact, those egg masses are how we think it got here in the first place. So the capacity and the likelihood for spread is high and I'll show you some, um, towards the end of my presentation, I'll show you some risk mapping that some other uh, folks have done to try to understand where we're most likely to see spotted lanternfly in the future. Um, but certainly, again, we kind of continue uh, to expect uh, continued spread and, and this map to update. Though I will say that generally speaking, the population growth is relatively slow. So when you look at other invasives um, like spotted wing drosophila, if you're familiar with that one, that one has you know 13 to 14 generations in a single year. And so you see the population growth very rapidly. Spotted lanternfly just has one generation per year. So it tends to be a little bit of a slower spread uh, compared to some of these other invasives we've had. That said, we still have high populations of spotted lanternfly within southeastern Pennsylvania. So this is um, during the fall season um, where we tend to see a lot of adult spotted lanternfly aggregating on trees. Now, this is not everywhere in southeastern Pennsylvania, but where we have high populations, particularly in this past year near Philadelphia and in, the, in these urban areas, we're just starting to see really high populations. So this has been, um, this has made my job very, very interesting, I would say, just because of the, the part of my job that deals with um, talking to the general public and making sure that they don't panic and know how to manage this pest um, to the best of our ability that we know how to manage it at least. Um, so you'll see high populations in people's backyards next to you know, play equipment, um, spotted lanternfly are also attracted to tall objects, so you'll see them falling down chimneys and actually getting inside people's homes. And of course, very similar to brown marmorated state bug uh, in the mid-Atlantic region, we see them actually uh, starting to aggregate on the outside of people's homes, on their windows. And so this pest very much has this high degree of human interaction. Um, and just a few more examples of that, which are just kind of crazy, is uh, folks who have the um, sort of automatic um, ringer outside of their front door that alerts them when somebody's at their front door. Spotted lanternfly have been known to frequently set those off. We see spotted lanternfly in our uh, meat section in the grocery store, in the clothing department, um, and we see spotted lanternfly also uh, in a lot of memes online that the public has kind of responded to this pest in a very interesting and, and often humorous way as well. 
uh, in particular, Halloween in southeastern Pennsylvania has been um, interesting and, and very creative. We see lots of dead uh, zombie spotted lanternflies out there. And I think uh, my personal favorite meme that I've seen with spotted lanternfly is ones that say, you know, I really want to dress up for spotted lantern and fly uh, for Halloween, but I'm afraid that I'm going to get uh, smashed to death just because they, there's this sort of recognition that the people in southeastern Pennsylvania hate this bug with such a, uh, a passion. We also have um, local mixed drinks, beers, and wines that have spotted lanternfly on the label. A lot of this is um, an effort to increase awareness uh, of spotted lanternfly and make sure that people People know that this is, you know, that quote unquote bad bug. Um, we also have, you know, some startup businesses with um, a father and his two sons who made this app um, to let people kind of compete with how many spotted lanternfly they kill in a given day. And so this is actually been a pretty funny app and you'll see that neighbors are, are entering their their daily kill numbers um, and trying to compete with the rest of their neighborhood in terms of how many they kill so again we're talking about a passion for killing this this particular insect um, we have people that have also um, tried to make jewelry earrings out of them and ornaments as well um, and then i think a really good way to talk about sort of the public interaction with spotted lanternfly has been the way that spotted lanternfly invaded philadelphia so two years ago, this this really um, started where more people on the outskirts of Philadelphia were experiencing lantern populations. Uh, but then this past year, in a big way, particularly uh, beginning in, say, late July, August, we started to see large numbers of adults um, kind of reach the city center. Um, and you'll see all sorts of crazy news stories about, you know, dead bodies piling up out um, outside of the uh, local Quidoba, um, and they had to close off that entrance just because there were so many dead bugs. Um, so this became such a problem even in 2019, where the Philadelphia police actually issued a statement that said, don't call 911 to report spotted lanternfly. It's not a police matter. Now, granted, they did do this in a humorous um, way, but they they legitimately had so many people calling 911 to report this insect that was, you know, climbing the outside of their 35th, 31st uh, story floor apartment building. And then uh, in not a political way at all, during the election, um, we saw, of course, um, the, the candidates visiting Philadelphia. And you'll notice that um, on top of uh, Mr. Biden's uh, uh, shoulder, there is spotted lanternfly that happened to be photographed with him. So certainly we know that that spotted lanternfly is really, um, you know, at attacking, if you will, um, people in a large way. Um, now they don't bite or they don't sting, but when you see sort of a large insect um, that's not afraid of approaching you in any way and can be kind of jumpy, people who aren't used to dealing with insects, of course, have a strong response. Um, we've also seen, you know, a lot of media attention with spotted lanternfly, including some big, big names like NPR, Associated Press, Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, and then a recent Smithsonian Magazine feature about spotted lanternfly. So there is a lot of coverage and a lot of attention on spotted lanternfly. And that sort of stems from the fact that there's a lot of panic about spotted lanternfly. Um, and so with anyone who here who, you know, kind of works with the public um, and, and has experienced this with other insects, you know how extreme this can get in some cases with people really starting to panic. And hopefully what I'll do with this talk is, is kind of distill down where we're seeing the biggest concern, um, but also things to watch for that we've experienced in Pennsylvania in terms of education that needs to be present for this invasive species. And in particular, um, I would say education with the general public is something that we've really tried to emphasize and tried to refine over and over again to make sure that folks are informed and, and safe about how they treat spotted lanternfly. And a few examples from these spotted lanternfly Facebook groups that we found of them using some crazy stuff. So air freshener, dish soap, human urine, um, and the person on the bottom has done a 20 acre sweep of a broad spectrum pyrethroid after just seeing three spotted lantern, or excuse me, five spotted lantern fly. So we have all across the spectrum people using a lot of different options for spotted lantern fly, things that they might consider to be safer, like air freshener or dish soap, because they use it inside their home. So of course it's safe for the environment is sort of, I think, thought there, but also people who just aren't trained in the risks of actual pesticides. So a lot of this has been making sure that we have safe options out there for them and they know what's safe um, so that we don't have this sort of panic in controlling spotted lantern fly. 
So sort of to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more broadly about the biology of spotted lanternfly, I of course have to talk about what spotted lanternfly is. Um, and some of you uh, may already uh, know this, but so spotted lanternfly is a, it belongs to the order Hemiptera. So it's a piercing sucking insect, somewhat closely related to say other leaf hoppers, stink bugs uh, or aphids. Um, and more specifically, it belongs into the insect family Fulgoridae. Um, and so this is this group of, of plant hoppers, which are most studied for their biodiversity and their evolutionary aspects. Now, they're most studied heavily in the tropics where they are very colorful and completely odd looking like the pyrops or this peanut headed bug, which is quite large and quite strange looking. Um, and so spotted lanternfly is actually the only known plant pest within this insect family. So it's kind of a black sheep in itself. And the reason that I bring that up is because spotted lanternfly isn't there this group of insects fulgority isn't really considered a insect pest so it's not studied in the same way that say stink bugs are so we really have zero baseline data on this insect on its basic biology sort of what it, what it's attracted to in order to start building integrated pest management against it so i would say that we really started from ground zero with this pest and kind of started throwing throwing different things at it and trying to see what would work and we've come a long way but there's still a lot of questions that we don't have answers to but uh, spotted lanternfly, you, you turn it around and you can see its large mouth part, um, which feeds on uh, plant sap through that mouth part. As it's feeding, it's excreting honeydew, much like aphids and mealybugs um, as it feeds only because it's much larger than an aphid or a mealybug, it really excretes honeydew at a much larger rate. And what we're finding when we actually dissect the mouth parts of spotted lanternfly and you look behind there uh, with aphids, um, if you have experience with that, you'll see a lot of striations and musculature in their mouth parts that help them pull up that plant sap. With spotted lanternfly, it's kind of like a black hole. It's a void. There's not a lot of musculature there. So this is kind of telling us, particularly uh, seeing the host that they feed on, that they're likely reliant on turgor pressure of the plant. They need Need something that's actively pushing plant sap, um, sort of tapping into a fire hose, if you will, so that they can successfully feed. Um, so here's a video that kind of shows them excreting that honeydew and, and how quickly they do it. This is now in slow motion, so you can kind of actually see uh, that flicking mechanism that they use uh, underneath um, to get that honeydew away from their bodies, prevent their wings from getting sticky, um, and you can be under a tree, particularly largely uh, heavily infested trees, and it actually feels like a light rain um, is is coming down on you. And in fact, it's it's insect poop, so it's very uh, not very pleasant. <laughs> Um, and what happens with this honeydew um, where spotted lanternfly is, is you get that accumulation of honeydew and then you get that colonization of sooty mold on top of that. Now we see this in vineyards in a big way, but we also see it in forested landscapes um, and people's backyards. So talk about a nuisance when you have sooty molds uh, getting onto your vehicle that maybe you've, you've parked under a tree and you really can't get sooty mold off very easily. Um, We've even had situations where uh, sooty mold has accumulated on people's uh, patio furniture and decks. Uh, this woman had power washed her deck, um, at least on the bottom stair, and took a photo of what it looked like for the rest of her, her decking, um, where it was actually so much honeydew that it made it slippery and that mold was growing on top of it. Um, we also had um, experiments uh, that were done from a, our, our landscape researcher, um, and he used basically umbrellas up, uh, turned upside down to capture dead spotted lanternfly from treated trees. And when you looked at these umbrellas at the end of the season, they were absolutely disgusting. So they were coated in that sooty mold and coated in that honeydew. So everything becomes very sticky. And of course, when you're talking about an open sugar resources being put out into that environment, particularly on such a large scale, you get a lot of ants and hornets and other things that are attracted to that honeydew. Um, more examples of that sooty mold. Um, both in the understory and within the plant canopy, it starts to colonize and it can actually start to kill that understory um, uh, under again, where there's large infestations of uh, spotted lanternfly. So when we talk about uh, spotted lanternfly, we of course have to go through the life stages and hopefully I'll show you so many pictures, you'll be, you'll be sick of seeing this insect, but just to make sure we're all on the same page and you make sure you know what you're looking for. Um, since spotted lanternfly does not occur in Utah, we wanna keep it that way. Um, so be on the lookout for all of these life stages. So um, the first life stage that is probably, um, you know, again, the hardest to identify is that egg mass stage. And I'll show you some other photos, but basically spotted lanternfly laying their eggs 
um, in rows of about 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. Um, and then they cover it with this mud-like covering that makes it pretty hard to see, pretty hard to distinguish, particularly from stones, vines, and other things that sort of blend in with um, bark, if you will. So this is the life stage that overwinters and then in the spring they hatch out as nymphs. They go through a couple of nymphal instars. So when they first hatch, they're quite small. They kind of look like um, ticks or spiders. And then with each instar, they start to grow and grow bigger. Um, so this, this fourth instar is right before the adults. You can start to see those, those wing pads being developed. And of course they turn bright red as well. And then into the adult stage, um, they of course become a lot more noticeable to the public um, where they have their wings usually folded over their back. Um, oftentimes when you when you first start learning about spotted lanternfly and seeing the media reports, you'll see them with their wings splayed out just because they look maybe a little bit prettier, catchier to the public. Generally speaking, they're not gonna do that unless they're, they're flying or startled or potentially poisoned with insecticide. Uh, now, one of the reasons that makes spotted lanternfly such a good invader very similar to other invasive pests is the fact that it has a broad host range. Um, so we have over 70 different plant species that have been identified um, as a host for spotted lanternfly. And the nymphs in particular are really prolific. So they'll feed on nearly anything that has nice green growth. Um, so basil, backyard, rose bushes, peony plants, corn, almost anything they'll feed on. Um, the, the, there is a short list of things that they don't usually prefer and that tends to be conifers. We don't see uh, any significant amount of feeding. And then also uh, Bradford pears, we haven't seen significant amount of feeding on that as well. It also has a somewhat shorter list of those favorite hosts that it really prefers. And on the top there are Tree of Heaven, so that invasive tree present throughout most of uh, pretty much almost entirely uh, the part of North America um, into Canada, into Mexico, very widely distributed invasive species. We also have wild and cultivated grape. And a good part of my presentation um, is going to focus on what we've seen in vineyards and sort of how we've responded to that. But then we also have really important both timber and landscape uh, or urban tree species like black walnut, red and silver maple, river birch, willow, sumac, and some other woodier species uh, that again are important for our, our landscape here in Pennsylvania. So when you think about the risk of spotted lanternfly and what what risk spotted lanternfly actually poses to um, to say our economy or, or um, the, the people who live here in Pennsylvania, here in the US, we can talk about the direct feeding damage from spotted lanternfly, which is sort of maybe the most obvious, right? So they're feeding on these plants, they're starting to deplete the nutrients from those plants. Um, and we're, that's where we're seeing yield losses, for example, in grapevines. You can also talk about that nuisance factor. So a lot of those photos I showed you earlier, like the honeydew, the sooty mold and the bugs themselves, where you know it can get so bad, so invested in certain areas that as you're walking into the grocery store they might be jumping on you from the surrounding telephone poles um, and again that's that's startling for humans it's not necessarily damaging um, but it's it's certainly annoying uh, and then we have the compliance with quarantine now Pennsylvania along with several other states that have established populations of spotted lanternfly have quarantines in place to prevent the movement of spotted lanternfly. It doesn't prevent the movement of goods, but it's more so a check to make sure that um, businesses have inspected their materials and they're free of spotted lanternfly before they ship any goods. Um, now, this is really important so that we're not spreading spotted lanternfly to a new state, say Utah, when we're shipping our materials. But of course, there's also this, this added um, economic factor when you talk about all these businesses having to go through this inspection procedure. Um, and one industry that's been hit probably the hardest by this compliance with that quarantine is the nursery industry, where we've seen inspection of plant material become very um, rigid, but also very difficult for them to maintain, um, which has been just costly for them. Uh, and they've also lost customers. Um, they've lost people from out of state who just don't want to buy products from Pennsylvania because they don't want that added risk. So again, there's there's both sides of the coin here, but it's really important that this quarantine is keeping people in business while at the same time preventing that movement of spotted lanternfly, and that can be a difficult balance to strike. Um, predominantly through the rest of my presentation, I'm going to focus on that feeding damage from spotted lanternfly. And again, most of my research happens in vineyards, so I'm going to talk a lot about that. But I also want to talk about some of the other agricultural crops uh, that we've sort of looked at to see where that risk is. Um, and so again, we've we've looked at some of these other agricultural crops, um, both 
for survivorship and potential plant damage. And some of these crops we've looked at, um, in particular the ones here that we've looked at plant damage, are ones that are commonly grown within Pennsylvania and ones that we're concerned about. So grapes, of course, being at the top of that list, but also hops, cucumber and other cucurbits, raspberry, peach, and hemp. And then we've also looked at survivorship on hardy kiwi fig, avocado, and tomato. Um, we don't grow avocado here in Pennsylvania, but um, we do are concerned about other states and what their predominant crops are and what risk they might have uh, when spotted lanternfly gets there. Um, so we'll continue to expand that host list and we're actually working with the Department of California uh, this coming year to look at some of their predominant crops and what might be most at risk for the growers out there. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of the data that we've collected, but I just want to share with you some of the data that we've got that was maybe sort of surprising to us. Um, in particular, cucumber uh, seems to be fairly affected by spotted lanternfly in that as you increase the number of lanternfly exposed on these cucumber plants, you're reducing the amount of yield you're seeing on those plants. And so we're seeing this association that the plant is responding to these infestation levels and lanternfly is actively feeding on these cucumber plants. Now, so far we haven't seen much of a problem in commercial production at this point, but we have seen a problem um, with backyard uh, gardens and, and smaller scale production systems uh, with cucumber. And we'll continue to look at this and continue to look at other cucurbits uh, in production as well to kind of you know continue to understand that potential risk. We've also looked at tree fruit. Now, um, you might see a lot of materials that talk about tree fruit with spotted lanternfly and see reports of them killing trees. Um, and we have not seen that so far. We do see populations of spotted lanternfly feeding on both apple and peach. Generally speaking, this is actually pretty rare. It's only usually occurring when spotted lanternfly are very active in a given area and you have a heavy infestation surrounding an orchard. That's generally when we tend to see this. That said, we're still worried about what might happen when they have less of a choice in the landscape and maybe they only have um, uh, peach and apple, or maybe that's the predominant agricultural crop in the surrounding area. So we looked at um, fourth in star spotted lanternfly and peach to look at how it might affect fruit abortion um, as those fruit are developing. And what we found is that there actually is an increased fruit abortion rate when spotted lanternfly exposed to those peaches. Now, this is a fairly preliminary study, something that we're continuing to investigate, but it is still, you know, that level of risk here where you have to think about um, you know, production of, of tree fruit in Utah, um, all the way from, you know, cherries to, to tree fruit. Um, and, and then of course to grapes where, you know, you could have, uh, could be putting these agricultural crops at risk. Um, we even saw a slight reduction and nothing is significant here, but we did see a slight reduction in raspberry production or raspberry growth, I should say, in terms of cane length, um, after being exposed to lanternfly. Um, and so again, I was surprised to see this just because brambles are fairly vigorous. Um, and so I'm surprised to see any reduction at all, but this is something that we'll continue to watch because we have seen lanternfly feed in commercial bramble production uh, in Pennsylvania, even though we've seen fairly low populations to date. And then when we just look at survivorship on other hosts like fig, avocado, and hardy kiwi, it's very high. So when we compare survivorship to tree of heaven, it's about 99% survival, but fig, avocado, and hardy kiwi all, uh, all follow close behind that. So I think that there's a lot of other crops that we need to start evaluating and understanding what that potential risk is. Again, nymphs in particular have a really broad host range, so they have an elevated risk compared to those adults, which, which seem to focus in a little bit more on certain hosts. Um, and one of those certain hosts, of course, includes grapevines. So again, I want to spend some time talking about what we've learned in grapevines. And there's a lot of similarities to what we've learned in grapevines to also what we've seen in uh, landscape trees and in forests. So what we've done um, to grapevines is basically try to really control the amount of lantern by feeding on these grapevines and measure the impact uh, that that vine is experiencing and how it's responding. So what we did is build these individual cages around grapevines and uh, release known numbers and very controlled old levels of lanternfly. So again, we have very precise amounts of lanternfly feeding on these grapevines and we can start to measure that impact. Now, what we found is that as you increase the number of lanternfly to these vines, you're reducing the photosynthetic activity and sap flow of the vines. And I mentioned that we're also doing a similar experiment in, uh, in established ornamental trees. So in maples, willows, and some others. And we're actually seeing the same thing where the more lanternfly you add to those trees, you're reducing your photosynthetic activity and your sap flow. 
in grapevines, we're also reducing the sugar content of the fruit. So the BRICS levels in our, in our harvestable fruit is reducing. And of course, one of the key quality uh, parameters that we look at when we're making wine is how much sugar is in the fruit. Uh, and then cold hardiness of the buds in the winter and yield in the following year is also being reduced with uh, lanternfly feeding on these grapevines. So there's a pretty significant economic hit to these growers that they're experiencing, particularly if we have a cold winter um, in Pennsylvania, then those grapes are more likely to experience that damage. Um, we validated this both uh, with these controlled studies and have also looked at what's happening to grower farms, grower operations. Um, and so this is data that we've taken um, from uh, basically each of these dots represents a, a single vine that we've monitored. Um, the average number of lanternfly we see on that vine in that year and then look at the clusters per shoot that that vine produces the following year. And what we see is a significant correlation where the more lanternfly you're adding to that vine, the fewer clusters per shoot it's likely to produce the following season. So the fact that we're getting this sort of relationship in very noisy field data is something that tells me that this is a strong enough relationship and growers are experiencing um, a strong enough effect of this yield reduction for us to be fairly concerned about it. And I will mention that all of these vineyards that were monitored all had active management of spotted lantern flies. So they're doing everything that they could to reduce those populations and avoid that risk of spotted lantern fly. Um, so overall, what we've seen in terms of grower damage um, and grower response to spotted lanternfly, um, we know that about 80% of the growers within our quarantine area within Pennsylvania are managing spotted lanternfly, um, and some growers don't yet have lanternfly on their vineyard, but it's more so a matter of, you know, lanternfly continuing to spread, and about 30% of the grower growers that we surveyed are reporting damage, and that damage comes in either yield losses or potential complete vine death from spotted lanternfly. And we also know that when we look at our spray records from these growers, um, we know that the average number of insecticide applications are increasing. So we have an increase of about 10 applications per year, and that's all pretty much loaded towards the end of the season when we have that peak of adult activity. Now, growers don't really have a lot of other options, other things that work very well apart from insecticide applications, but we of course know that that added insecticide application um, has economic considerations, but of course environmental and sustainability considerations as well. And apart from, you know, that direct economic hit to that grower and even the sustainability of, of the control options that we have, I think it's important to talk about uh, what spotted lanternfly is doing um, also sort of in a psychological sense. Um, so we did a survey last year of the growers that are managing spotted lanternfly on their farm. Um, and the numbers here I think are kind of uh, surprising, I guess. And so 57% of the growers, again, those that are actively dealing with spotted lanternfly say that lanternfly changes the outlook on the future of their farm when they're thinking about replanting or expanding or, or maybe handing the farm down to their next generation. Now, 62% of growers also say that lanternfly contributes either highly or moderately to their stress level. So this is something I think we need to be concerned with. It's not just, again, that economic consideration, what's happening on the farm or the added time in the, in the, tr in the tractor spraying. It's also about that added stress of spotted lanternfly and what that might do to, you know, the idea of grape production within our state. Um, so to kind of show you what growers are dealing with and what it looks like um, in the vineyards uh, in the springtime pretty soon here, I guess, um, uh, in late April, um, mid-May, we'll start to see those nymphs hatch out. So these are egg masses that are uh, been laid on a, a post outside of a vineyard, and you can see the small nymphs hatching from it. So the first instars look, again, very tick-like, very spidery when they first hatch, and they tend to be mostly black. They have a little bit of time before those kind of iridescent white spots start to develop on them. Um, and if you're curious about what that hatching looks like, there's kind of a fun video uh, taken from uh, USDA APHIS. Um, and if you watch this one in the back in particular, you can just see its pronotum kind of uh, inflate, if you will. So it's kind of entertaining to, to watch this particular video, at least in my opinion. <laughs> and I will say this is also is not in real time. So we are we have sped it up a little bit as well. 
Um, so when they first hatch, after they first hatch, they go right to green tissue. Pretty much what they hatch on is what they feed on for at least a couple of days. Um, so if they were, you know, laid eggs on a red maple tree, they'll tend to feed right on that green luscious growth at the top of the tree. But then they seem to be a little bit more choosy and they seem to kind of look for something else in the landscape. And you'll see that really with the nymphal instars is that movement is almost continuous. Even if they find a good host, they really don't stay there for very long. So when they first hatch for whatever reason for about a week, they're really attracted to rose bushes, both multiflora invasive rose, but also cultivated rose in people's backyards. Um, and then of course we start to see them move towards other hosts. So fourth instars in particular are very attracted to black walnut in Pennsylvania. Uh, in vineyards, it's really not until late season where we start to see the, the problem begin, and this is with the adult stage. So again, adults come out in about late July. Um, typically, when they first turn into adults, they don't move around a lot. They tend to stay on their host, kind of hang tight um, and, and feed, feed very voraciously. Um, and again, with that honeydew production, you start to see a lot of honeydew accumulating as they turn into adults. Um, but then there seems to be a switch that happens, um, something that's likely related to mating where all of a sudden they're in movement and they're looking for other hosts. And grapevines are one of those hosts that seem to be very attractive to them um, and they, they tend to flock to. Um, and this past season, we saw a healthy uh, deposition of egg masses in the vineyards that, that we work in. Um, so again, you can see large numbers of egg masses all kind of laid on top of each other with the adults um, in the process of, of laying the females in the process of laying even more egg masses. And so what we found is that females are actually attracted to laying egg masses next to existing egg masses. So there is likely some visual maybe olfactory cue that's telling them, hey, this is a good spot to lay egg masses. So they, we tend to see this kind of um, aggregation of egg masses within, uh, within any given area in a vineyard or even in a woodlot. Um, in vineyards and almost anywhere, Spotted lanterfly tend to lay in protected areas. So you can see them on the inside of these metal posts, um, on the undersides of the bark. Um, and so when you start to see photos like this, you get this idea of why spotted lanternfly can be such a problem to detect in the first place. And again, we think we got those that initial population in the US from egg masses. So if you imagine something that looks like this on um, landscaping stone that is maybe this same color, that's going to be really hard to pick up on and, and pick up on that as a potential invasive insect. Uh, and again, more examples of where they might be laying egg masses uh, can get kind of extreme or kind of crazy. They get creative. Um, so here they are laying on the outside of a outdoor light bulb on cushy patio furniture, camping chairs, undersides of flower boxes, and tires. Um, probably the most concerning place I've ever seen a spotted lanternfly egg mass is on a tractor trailer on the underside of the uh, footstep. They've they laid some egg masses there. But it can even get as crazy as this lady's hat, right? So they, de they tend to be not specific about where they lay egg masses. They do have preferences, but at the same time, there's so many lanternfly laying egg masses in the current population that they get very creative about where to lay. So when we look at egg mass, or excuse me, the average populations of spotted lanternfly in the vineyards, um, we've been monitoring the same vineyards for the past three years to try to get at this predictability and try to understand how we can develop these kind of risk factors of when we're going to start seeing spotted lanternfly and when we can alleviate that. So here's the average number of lanternfly per vine throughout the season. And what you can see immediately is that while we do get an early blip early in the season when a uh, lanternfly first hatch, that tends to be taken care of with an early insecticide spray that can be multi-purpose for other insects like Japanese beetle. Um, and then we don't really see reinvasion or re-entry into that vineyard until you get into pretty much September. Um, and so this is problematic uh, for, for basically two reasons. When you think about grape harvest, it's that September to October period for most varieties. So if you have some early varieties, you might get lucky, but by and large, it's going to be a uh, harvest time when spotted lanternfly are peaking. And that's a problem because that means that you have to use uh, insecticides that don't last very long because you don't want any residue on your fruit. So you have to use short pre-harvest interval compounds and spotted lanternfly are present throughout the landscape. So you get this continuous reinvasion into your vineyard and you have to use products that don't last very long. And so this is really what gets us into this cyclic behavior of spraying you know, every couple of days because we don't have a better option. And to show you uh, what that looks like here in this vineyard of that, that sort of flight activity and kind of continuous flight activity, 
everything you see in the sky right now, it's not the best video, so I apologize for that, but everything you see in the sky is spotted lanternfly flying from the vineyard to the surrounding landscape, from the surrounding landscape back to the vineyard, from vine to vine, just a lot of movement that you see happening. Um, and again, I'll, I'll kind of walk closer to this vine and show you what, what that looks like in the fields, what those vines are experiencing. Um, and we see just really enormous populations on these vines feeding on that plant sap, feeding on that plant sap. So when you start to think about the stressors are on this vine or any given plant that's experiencing this. So we've, the, I think the most we've ever counted on a single tree, about a 30 foot tall silver maple tree was uh, around 13,000 spotted lanternfly that dropped out of it after we injected it with an insecticide, uh, a, a neonicotinoid insecticide. So really a lot of pressure that can start to accumulate on these trees and on these plants um, from spotted lanternfly. And the other thing that we're finding is that spotted lanternfly are actually attracted to each other. So when a couple start it, more will come, more will come, more will come, and you tend to see certain plants attacked more than others. So we're starting to gain some predictability with spotted lanternfly. There's still a lot we don't know, again, stemming from that fact that we don't have a lot of baseline behavior. Uh, information on behavior on biology and what spotted lanternfly might be attracted to but we are starting to gain some predictability and that helps us refine um, and optimize our management. Um, so when we talk about management in a general context um, the first thing that people usually ask about is are there any natural enemies any predators that are going to help control it. So we do have generalist predators that are, are found to control spotted lanternfly or I should say attack spotted lanternfly but not control the population. So Praying mantises are common ones, but we also see ants, um, podiasis stink bugs, uh, crab spiders, all sorts of spiders attack spotted lanternfly. Wheel bugs are another really common one. We're actually seeing more wheel bug eggs laid next to spotted lanternfly agnases. Um, it seems like they're starting to synchronize uh, with spotted lanternfly, which is pretty cool. That said, nothing here is controlling the population. We are also continuing to look at bird activity and whether or not those are starting to eat spotted lanternfly. Um, we've identified a fair number of bird species that are eating spotted lanternfly, though again, we haven't seen anything really take a liking to spotted lanternfly. So I think there is still that associative learning and trying to establish whether or not this uh, particular species is toxic, which is something we still have not been able to establish. Um, and there are two very different opinions in the scientific community about this now. Some really believe that there's toxins being sequestered and others don't think so at all. So jury is absolutely still out on that one. And of course, when we think about um, biological control uh, with an invasive species, we have to think about uh, classical biological control. Um, so folks from USDA APHIS and USDA ARS have teamed up um, to uh, travel to China. They actually started um, traveling to China in 2015, um, before uh, a year after spotted lanternfly was established in uh, the US to look for these um, natural enemies. And so they've identified two different parasitoids. These yellow areas are places that they've traveled traveled in China. This is actually a slightly outdated map where they've started to expand their reach. Um, and they've found two parasitoid species. So one is an egg parasitoid called Anastatus orientalis. Um, and then the other is a nymphal parasitoid, which is, which is a dryanid species. This one is super cool. It's got these raptorial um, forelegs that can kind of hop onto the spotted lanternfly, grab hold of it, and then um, sting it to put that egg inside. And it actually creates this kind of secondary sac outside of the nymph um, where it develops develops as that nymph continues to hop around and finally when it emerges it kills that nymph. Um, so pretty cool life history on that guy, but um, both both of these parasitoid species are currently in a, a U.S. quarantine facility that's undergoing testing. Um, actually Anastatus exists in three different quarantine quarantine facilities, one currently out in California, and then Dryanus is in one uh, quarantine facility. Unfortunately, I'll say the update with Anastatus, that's where we have the most data because it has two generations per year. Um, it's attacking a lot of other non-target species, including things like the predatory stink bug um, and even silk moths and, and some others. So it does not appear to be very uh, specific. So the goal kind of with this genus is to look for another Anastatus species that's attacking spotted lanternfly within China to see if that one might be a little bit more specific to spotted lanternfly. Dryanus is still ongoing, um, though it's a little bit harder to rear in our quarantine facilities. So 
that one, you know, we're still working on and trying to get more data on. So this is absolutely a long term procedure. It's not something that we're likely to release in the near future, but I'm, I'm certainly glad it's already been started and been started and established for so long. Um, with biological control, we also have fungal pathogens that are attacking spotted lanternfly. Um, and so there's, there's been two species that have been identified attacking spotted lanternfly. One is Bovaria bassiana, so really common fungal pathogen that's present and attacks a lot of different insects, um, insect species, and it's also commercially available. So this is something that we've actually been able to play with and manipulate in the environment to see if it might control lanternfly on a landscape scale. Um, the, the kind of the, the short news there, I'll, I'll sort of summarize that. And if there's questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about it. Um, but my short summary there is it still needs a lot of refinement. We're unfortunately not seeing the control we wanted to get um, using Bavaria bassiana. The other pathogen that we found um, was identified by Anne Hayek at Cornell University um, as Batcoa major. And that's pictured down here. Uh, very, very, very little is known about this uh, species. Um, we found that it's very exciting that it attacks spotted lanternfly, but it was only found in one location. So whether or not this was kind of just a blue board, something we can kind of maybe manipulate or see if it can happen elsewhere is sort of yet to be known. Um, though I will say this one is particularly cool. It's um, one of those, you know, sort of mind um, controlling fungi species, uh, which tells lanternfly to kind of crawl up and then once it crawls up it starts to sporulate and actually sew them to the tree and then eats them from the inside does what they do and then they sporulate and so the idea of them being high is that they're sporulating down on everybody else down below in the canopy so that they can infect more spotted lanternfly so again very cool biology there um, so with biological control, it's something we're looking into, it's something we're currently studying, but right now it's not the answer for controlling in the short term. So we've done a lot of insecticide work. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in this past year focusing on insecticides and how to optimize and which products are best to use. Again, a lot of my research is in vineyard settings, but we've also done this for nursery operations and just products for homeowners to try to determine what they can use. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, the good news is that when do residual efficacy, contact efficacy, we've learned that spotted lanternfly is actually pretty easy to kill with insecticides. In a vineyard setting, we're pretty much reliant on, on two chemical classes, which are neonicotinoids and pyrethroids, though I will say that carbamates um, and organophosphates also are effective. They're just less commonly used. And then in homeowner situations, we do have contact efficacy with things like neem oil and insecticidal soap. So we can get efficacy using a fair range of chemical classes. Um, of course, in the short term with us applying these insecticides, we are seeing increases in secondary pest outbreaks in vineyards, um, but also even in forests, we've seen increases in scale and mealy bug. So we're paying attention to this and trying to make sure that we have other options available, at least as soon as we can possibly get those so that we don't tend to create other problems here. Uh, in vineyards, we're also looking at, again, optimization of where we're putting the insecticide. Um, and so here we looked at two different sprayers, which are going to deposit insecticide differently in the vineyard. So the one in the back here is an uh, over the row sprayer. And then in the one in the front here is a border row spray. So we're just looking to, to do a cannon blast of insecticide on the edge of the vineyard. And the reason that we're interested in doing this is because spotted lanternfly spatially within a vineyard and, and, and within nursery settings as well, uh, ornamental nursery settings, um, we see that they're edge dominated. So they're not found within the interior of the vineyard um, or the interior of the nursery operation. They're found on the edge. And so we can utilize that spatial distribution um, where about 54% of spotted lanternfly are observed within the first 50 feet of the vineyard edge. So again, we want to utilize that and just treat that area. And if you're able to get control of that area, then you're maybe doing a pretty good job at controlling the majority of your lanternfly. So here's that cannon sprayer in action, um, spraying the edge of the vineyard again, trying to get a targeted spray where lanternfly is existing. Again, I'm not going to spend most a lot of time on that just because I want to give an overview here, but border sprays were actually very effective at reducing spotted lanternfly, pretty much perform the same as our every row spray, but we're reducing the amount of time that the operator needs to spend in the tractor, and we're also reducing the amount of chemical that we're putting out in the environment. So should the grower be able and have access to this sort of equipment, I think this could be a really good option.
We've also looked at things like exclusion netting. Um, and so we uh, have applied this and we found that it works really well, almost 100% control of spotted lanternfly in vineyards with very little um, uh, in terms of disease increases um, in the grapes themselves. Uh, we did see slightly reduced sugar content because of that uh, uh, re reduction in light penetration into the canopy. Um, that said, I think this is an option mostly for smaller scale growers, not so much for large growers that, that need a lot of labor to install netting like this. Uh, and then the last kind of crazy idea that we tried this year in vineyards um, was this idea of a flight intercept wall, something that can stop them from coming into the vineyard and sort of treat them on site. So this kind of stems back from the fact, again, that lanternfly are attracted to tall objects. So here they are as proof. I'm standing in the middle of the field and I happen to be the tallest object around and they're all walking up my pant leg, which again, if you're in southeastern Pennsylvania and you're not used to insects, I love insects. I'm an entomologist by training, but this is not something that's overly pleasant. It's at least very annoying, particularly as they tend to sit on the back of your neck. That tends to be their preferred spot to kind of hang out when they're on you. So we try to take advantage of that tall behavior, the fact that they are seeking out tall objects, um, and use this uh, sort of wall approach where we had about a 14 foot wall here, um, and it was covered with insecticide treated netting. Now this insecticide has been um, impregnated within the netting. It's originally developed for mosquitoes, for bed nets, and we've decided to use it for spotted lanternfly. Um, I, I, of course, can't take credit for that. There's actually an apple grower who came up with this idea for brown worm rated stink bug control in Pennsylvania, um, and we've used it for spotted lanternfly. And what we're finding is that it kills lots of lanternfly in the two months that was it, that it was installed in this vineyard. It killed around 15,000 spotted lanternfly. And we're also finding it's reducing the amount of spotted lanternfly on the vines. So if you look at the no net compared to the treated net control here, so uh, gray versus pink bar, and looking at the average number of lanternfly on the vines, you see this reduction in um, spotted lanternfly populations on the vine when they're next to that, that basically flight inner intercept wall. Um, that said, um, we're seeing that even when those um, lanternfly populations are reduced, as you move away from that wall, you start to see less of an effect. So um, because they're an edge pest, most of the population is within these first two rows anyway. But again, we have to start to kind of, I think, optimize this a little bit more and make it a little bit more cost effective for growers. Um, though we have used both the tall objects and this insecticide thing, both as a monitoring tool in new areas using telephone poles and actually partnering um, with uh, um, electricity uh, operations to get these traps set up on top of um, utility poles and then starting to use hot poles and, and other kind of walls in vineyards to see if we can control populations that way. So sort of my summary here is that, again, lanternfly is a major pest of grapevines, and that continues to be the case. We're also seeing other crops at risk, um, and we don't have management options that are currently cost effective or really very sustainable and spread within Pennsylvania is continuing. So we, we have a problem here, of course. It's not, you know, we're not talking about this pest for no reason. It's certainly something that's considered a big uh, threat. And I think as we kind of continue to learn more about spotted lanternfly, we have this emphasized need for landscape scale control because of that broad host range, because it's present throughout the landscape. So while we're continuing to research, while I, I hope there's lots of time before spotted lanternfly does get to Utah, we still have this need to have this, of course, on our radar and hopefully you know, all of you will be out there watching for spotted lanternfly and reporting it, you know, if you see it. The last thing I want to talk about um, is work that's not mine, but coming from Temple University, where we have um, these great partners who have worked to um, mathematically and ecologically model spotted lanternfly risk. And so I just wanted to share with you what that map looks like. So this is uh, the map. The more red the area, the more suitable the area is for spotted lanternfly establishment. Um, so you can see the region in Pennsylvania where it is now, definitely very suitable. If you zoom in a little bit on Utah, there are some red areas, areas where um, establishment is likely. So again, this, this pest poses a lot of risks to um, a variety of industries. Um, and so I think that continued spread is going to be likely, but population growth again is relatively slow. So what I would say is my kind of uh, advice that I'll leave you with before we go into questions is to 
be alert and keep up to date with um, USU Extension and the Department of Agriculture. Make sure that you know what's going on in your state and make sure that you have this bug on your radar so that if you see it when you're out and about, um, you can at least educate others about it and make sure that you get it reported immediately. Um, so with that, I want to thank all the folks that have worked with me on these projects, including the awesome group of grower collaborators that we've had. And then hopefully I have time for questions.